a congregation is more about a people than it is about a place. There's something wrong in our spiritual life when we see Unitarian Universalism as a thing to practice only here at 1911 Cliff Valley Way in this space under these lights on Sunday. And then when we drive away, when Sunday morning's done, we drive away, we leave our Unitarian Universalist identity behind us. That's not right. A congregation is more about a people than a place. And yet, we cannot deny that a place is, sig is significantly uh, important to a people. Place is important. Places gather people. Places make certain experiences possible that couldn't happen otherwise. Places, through carefully chosen architecture and aesthetics, they make the invisible visible and tangible, the invisibles of spirit and values and commitment. This house is a cradle for our dreams. It is a workshop for all our endeavors. For 50 years now, that's what's been happening here at 1911 Cliff Valley Way, under this roof in this space. And to celebrate this, well, we want to do what makes for any good celebration of a milestone or a birthday. We want to tell stories. We want to share stories that are meaningful and good and full and remind us about who we are. I've asked architect and longtime member Bill Pulgram to share some of these stories related to our beginnings, the nuts and bolts of uh, coming here, all of that. And following this, another longtime member, Nina West, she's going to share stories of what it was like to actually grow up in this building, to be here through our 50 years in this space. And I will follow up these two wonderful, you've got a treat ahead of you. I'm going to follow up these speakers. I'm going to be the caboose this morning, and uh, we'll say a few words to tie things up. Bill. Uh, I'll talk from memory as to just what happened. And, and uh, Anthony, I can't promise to say the same thing. You told me to say the same thing from the first service, but I can't promise that. <laughs> uh, but, to, but to refresh my memory, and just to make sure I didn't go off on a tangent somewhere, I called one of our ministers emeritus, Gene Pickett, and asked him, because he was, the, uh, he was our minister at the time that this change took, took took place. He now lives in Cape Cod in retirement. And I also called Walter Dowdle, who some of you may remember, uh, who was at the CD at the Community Center. He, he was a deputy he was the deputy director of the of the CDC at the time. He's now retired on his plantation down in South Georgia. But anyhow, uh, to begin with my story, uh, Lucia, my wife and I were talking about joining some, some religious group of some kind, a liberal group, and we had heard about the United Liberal Church, and that was the name of this congregation at that time. And we looked it up and we found an address, and it was on, on, it was on Boulevard. And Boulevard, I knew where Boulevard was, but I didn't know exactly where the church was, and uh, we didn't have a GPS at that time, so I was just sort of walking around and trying to find what, just where this place was. Uh, the building was a fairly nondescript building. Uh, it was located on the east side of Boulevard, just south of North Avenue, right adjacent to a Gulf filling station. Uh, and uh, it was an old church. The, the United Liberal Church congregation had uh, purchased the building from a Mormon group, uh, which, was, which were the previous owners. But by looking at the pulpit inside this church, just over to the left side, there was a baptismal font. So I didn't, so it was quite, became quite obvious that this used to be a Baptist church. And it was probably built as a Baptist neighborhood church in the early 19th century. I'm not sure when or how, but, uh, the, uh, but the United Liberal Church bought it from Mormons in, 19, in, in the early 50s. 
We went there the first time as visitors in 1961, and then we stuck around uh, and came back in 1962. And there was some murmurs going on in the congregation about finding a new place. I was a new member, and nobody really, I was not in on all the things that were going on at the time. Uh, but there were some feelings in going, uh, and some happenings. There seemed to be some kind of a fundraising that was being initiated. And then when Gene Pickett came in the February of 1962, uh, the momentum sort of upped a little bit, and he became enthusiastic, and the, uh, and the congregation became enthusiastic. The president at that time was Harry Adley, who was a who was a city planner, as Miles know, uh, and uh, he was enthusiastic about what I mean. I mean, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this place, which was kind of dingy and old and run down? Uh, it had old church wood pews and all in a row, and downstairs was a, a sort of a grimy basement with a few rooms in it that served as the Sunday school rooms. And upstairs, right next to the sanctuary, there were a couple of offices. Uh, uh, I mean, our, our church at that time, the staff was a minister and a secretary, and that's all we had. And there were about 130-something members. Uh, but it, the place was not an adequate place for a Unitarian. At that time, we weren't, yeah, we were, uni, we were Unitarians, but we were called, called the United Liberal Church. So, just to go on and uh, not, take, not take too much time. After Harry Adley uh, 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 was no longer president, he became a member of or started a building committee. He was the chair of a building committee. And we were just sort of, the, there was a debate going on, I was told, as to just what to do, where to go, when to go, how to go. How do we move out of here? How do we finance a new building? Because the congregation, all the congregation had was uh, the, uh, the only assets were the buildings that we were in, which wasn't a whole lot. So how do you buy a site and then thereafter have a down payment for a construction and, and get mortgages with the kind of credit that we had, which we didn't have, but it's just where, and also where to go. Most of our members at that time lived in the northeast section of, Atla of Atlanta. And as a matter of fact, about 10% of the members were uh, in some way affiliated with CDC, with the Community Disease, uh, uh, Disease Center, which was, they were all very bright people and eager, eager, eager to go. So uh, finally, the building committee said, okay, we'll go, uh, we can look at some of these places for sites. They zeroed in on some possible sites. So what do we do about uh, buying such a site? We had to sell the church. So the real estate people were called, and the real estate people said, I think we can sell that church. And the church was put on the market. There were several offers. One of the offers was from, the, from, the, uh, from, the black, from a black Muslim group. And the congregation didn't like that idea and turned it down, not because they were Muslims, but because it was a black group. Was, there was going to be a strictly black congregation, which was against our, uh, uh, which, which is not what we wanted. We were the only, the only integrated church in Atlanta at the time. So we wanted it to, be, to remain, if it was to be a church, a more liberal congregation that was open to everybody who wanted to come. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and another offer we had was from the Gulf Oil people who wanted to expand their filling station that was next door. <laughs> so, and uh, they offered us $120,000, which was a good offer at the time. The church was sold. And in the meantime, before the church was sold, the building committee had to look for a place where we could have temporary locations, where we could hold service temporarily. A building was found, an old uh, school building, which was no longer used as a school, on 10th Street between Peachtree and Piedmont. And we were given a few rooms and a, and, and a big room that was a kind of a meeting room. And we were told, if you come in here, you can have it from 9 until 12. And at 12 o'clock, you've got to put it back in shape the way, the way you found it when the, when the, uh, uh, when the f service first started. 
So that meant uh, every Sunday morning putting up a hundred movable chairs of putting down a platform about the height of this, so the, so, the min, so the minister would be raised slightly above the floor. We built a, uh, a demountable pulpit, and we built a screen behind it, a folding screen, so the, so the minister would have some background, so people would see him, because it, it was not a bright place, right? A bright place by any means. And, to, uh, and in keeping with our... Uh, in keeping with our interest in the arts, uh, we every Sunday morning, I remember, uh, actually Dina Short and Lucia formed this fine arts committee, uh, and every Sunday morning, we hauled a big painting, about four feet wide and two and a half, uh, to this schoolhouse and hung it in the lobby, just to make it a more individual place. And in, after the service, we took it down, put it in the car, and took it back to where it belonged. <laughs> And and uh, and the and uh, and we and we borrowed those uh, paintings. Uh, I think Lucia remembers better than I do. I think they were private owners, and also the High Museum. At that time, the High Museum would actually lend us some paintings to hang for a morning <laughs> in our in our sanctuary, quote, in the lobby. That went on uh, quite quite a while, of course. And the other question was, how do we store the belongings of the church? When we moved, there were items that we wanted to keep and, and carry on and take to this new building. And I remember one item that I was given to keep was a seven-foot ladder <laughs> that nobody else seemed to have room for. So I kept that ladder, and it's, I don't think it's still here, but it did come to this building at that time. Uh, next thing was buying a site. We had difficulty locating a site uh, in the, uh, we were looking, I mean, we looked at, we, I've seen the building committee, which I was not a member of at the time, uh, looked at, at, uh, uh, at some neighborhoods in northeast Atlanta, in, in the residential areas, they wouldn't have us. Uh, the neighborhoods found some good reasons to reject and made the zoning committee not permit this construction of this new building. We were in an integrated church. And they didn't want those kinds of people in their neighborhood. So that was difficult. Finally, we settled on this particular site. Uh, and an architect was selected, which was Joan Misano, a uh, very talented man. Uh, and uh, a, a program was written as to what, as what we needed. And of course, it was more than we could afford. And the architect designed a very handsome building. But it was, not, uh, it was, it was too expensive. And, you know, and secondly, it was turned down because it was an exposed concrete structure, and the, and uh, uh, which was it was quite handsome, uh, but uh, but the membership wouldn't buy that exposed concrete. They wanted brick. Okay, we got a good brick building. Uh, the uh, ground broken ground was broken in 1965 in the fall, October, November, on a grisly rainy day, right out here in the mud, kind kind of. Construction was supposed to start then, but it was delayed because of weather. We were supposed to move in in the, uh, in the fall of 1966. That didn't go. Uh, but finally, the congregation got to be very impatient. They wanted to get into that, into that new building. And we really moved in here about a week before we should have. Some of the stuff wasn't even finished yet. But there was so much enthusiasm for getting going and getting going, so we finally moved in. And we finally moved in. There's one other thing, and uh, uh, there were several things during the opening that I want to mention. The first art show we had uh, were, uh, was the work by Ben Smith. Uh, who was a young man uh, who did these great big block prints, and it was wonderful. And one of his prints was on the face of the invitation for the opening. And another thing, the congregation, uh, I mean, when they wanted to go beyond the membership. So we initiated, we, the congregation, initiated the Fine Arts Committee, an arts festival uh, that lasted for two months. Uh, and the festival was for painting, and, uh, and poetry, uh, and the drama, and music. And for two months, every Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, we had a discussion or a reading uh, of poetry or dramatic presentations or chamber music and all this sort of thing. So that was the beginning of this congregation, and it's carried on, and I'm delighted to be here to tell you about it. Thank you.
In my earliest memories of this building, I am with my family. I see this space through very young eyes. And this is how it looks. I am standing in this sanctuary, and it is mostly dark. Natural light illuminates this room from the openings at the apex and where there will eventually be doors. I see giant, gray, concrete steps where the pews will be. I want to climb them. I want to have long legs to climb pew steps. I see concrete walls not yet clad in brick. No carpet covers the real stairs, nothing to dampen sound so our voices echo a little as we speak. By the time this building was being constructed, my family had been part of this congregation for about four years. Our family visited this site regularly to see the progress. I can remember when the walls for the classrooms around the perimeter of the sanctuary were framed with wood two by fours, and my siblings and I imagined we had superpowers and could melt through walls as we passed from room to room. Out on the patio were steep stairs, as there are now, but, and they went to the basement, but there were no barriers to prevent our descent, nor doors at the bottom. At some point, it rained, and the lower level flooded, but I, child that I was, only found that enchanting. <laughs> I'd had some childhood fantasy of a home with a swimming pool inside, and the flooded basement was the realization of that idea. I stood at the bottom step, gazing at the water that may have been only inches deep, and thought of how I would swim, or at least wade, in our church home pool. I gather adults had a less romantic view of that feature. <laughs> Oddly, I have no specific recollection of the first Sunday we, as a community, began to live in this home. What I have instead are many memories of this place as the center of my family's life, and how the structure of this place has provided me with a symbol of inner life and outer life. I have long believed that the architecture we occupy and the geography of place shape us, help us become who we are as surely as our families and peers impress themselves deeply on our psyches. An example, as a child, after RE classes, I would find myself walking the perimeter of the sanctuary. Back then, the office wing and other changes hadn't yet been made, so the building was a square containing a round sanctuary. In adulthood, I learned the name of that form, a mandala, a geometric figure that at its most basic is a circle within a square. It symbolizes wholeness, unity. By growing up in this physical space, I was experiencing a mandala in the deepest of ways. I have walked probably hundreds of miles in this mandala, and that symbol engraved itself in my mind and heart helped me visualize what it is to be whole, to be complete. This building, this mandala, is the container, and this congregation embodies all of the ideals that were a part of my religious education. I remember where in this place I first learned the story of the Good Samaritan, learned about the Tower of Babel, was introduced to the concept of situational ethics and the idea that there are not always simple solutions to problems. This is where I learned that adults, in addition to my parents, would listen to me, valued my thoughts, it is here that I was given some of my first opportunities in leadership. I grew up seeing all kinds of art on the walls of my congregational living room. I've shared food at Thanksgiving with people whose own families were far away, purchased gifts for my siblings, and learned about giving. I also explored the natural world around this building, got to find out what it was like to have tadpoles nibble on my fingertip looked at the stars while waiting for my parents to pick me up. And it was here, as a teen in the youth group, liberal religious youth, that this building became most like my home. UUCA sometimes hosted youth conferences of teens from UU congregations all over the Southeast. I've slept in the coat closets and in the halls as a teen. 
I've cooked green spaghetti with friends in the kitchen, have played with a parachute here in the sanctuary. Essentially every significant part of my life, mostly good as well as a couple of painful things, began here. I met my best friend here when I was 14 in the bathroom while washing our hands back when it was located approximately there underneath the stairs or under the pews here. We sat down on the floor and started talking, are still talking 44 years later. Here is where I met a boy who had introduced me to the man I married and with whom I have two children. This sanctuary is where my mom was ordained as a UU minister, where my husband and I got married, where my family and friends said goodbyes to my father at his memorial service. I've watched my own daughters bridge here in this space after going through the coming of age program. I could tell you for hours and in detail about all the living and learning that has originated from this center of my life. As an LRY teen, sometimes our youth conferences took place in other cities. We had an advisor who drove us to and from conferences in his bus. He would cue up a song when we returned so that as we drove down the access road, we sang together, our house is a very, very, very fine house. This building is home and the congregation is my larger family this living mandala, symbol of wholeness. Let's give another round of applause to Bill and Nina. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, wonderful. Bill and Nina are voices of the people who moved into this new space and made a new start all those, all those years ago. They were seekers. Coming into this space, they carried with them the sorrows and the joys of their time, like race riots and assassinations, all that weirdly juxtaposed with joys like the Beatles, and the twist and, and grainy images of the surface of Mars. And they sought meaning in them, sought ways to heal the injustice and to amplify the joy and to stay courageous in a constantly changing world. And we are exactly alike 50 years later. We carry our own joys and sorrows into this space as well. As we, and we seek the same things that they sought. Just listen to some of the joys and sorrows of our time selected from this past year alone. Water is discovered on Mars. Way too much water in the Midwest and terrible flooding, Texas tornadoes, generally unprecedented weirdness in our winter weather, Atlanta's warmest Christmas day ever at 75 degrees. The devastating 7.3 magnitude earthquake in Nepal. Cecil the lion killed by an American dentist. The Paris Climate Conference, which resulted in the landmark Paris Agreement featuring a commitment to limit the temperature increase to less than two degrees Celsius. Pope Francis in America and Africa. The refugee crisis, the largest that Europe has seen since World War II. Love wins. The Supreme Court declares same-sex marriage legal. A new era in late night TV. 
Stephen Colbert takes over from David Letterman, and Trevor Noah takes over from Jon Stewart. Mass shootings in the US, Charleston, Chattanooga, Roseburg, Colorado Springs, San Bernardino, the Black Lives Matter movement, to curb police violence, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald. Most recently, a Cleveland grand jury declined to bring charges in the death of Tamir Rice, a black youth with a toy gun who was shot by a white police officer. 13 months, or 13 months ago, campus unrest, principally at the University of Missouri, and the stand that that football team took in refusing to play, a stand that led to the resignation of the university president. The new Star Wars, The Force Awakens. Donald Trump, a billion, I like that response. <laughs> billionaire demagogue who proudly and openly stokes racial and religious fears, still going strong in the polls. Caitlyn Jenner, record interest in the transgender community. Adele. Now Google says that of all the internet searches from 2015, searches for Adele rank at number two with 439 million. Can you believe it? And, the, and what people were looking for, basically, for the most part, was when will Adele's new album come out? <laughs> and number one, according to Google, Paris under attack at 897 million searches. The November 19th attack that killed 130 people was the deadliest event on French soil since World War II. What does it feel like for you to hear this list? What does it feel like for you to hear this list? Joy and woe are woven fine, writes the poet William Blake. Joy and woe woven fine. So much that is interesting and inspiring. So much that hurts to hear and creates intense anxiety about what happens next. What is our world going to look like in the upcoming year, the upcoming decade? And we know that I could go on and on up here. I'm not even touching the more private joys and sorrows from the past year that each of us brings into this space this morning. But as in our past, so in our future. Together, we are more than any one person can be alone. For 50 years, this place has gathered us and it continues to gather us today, the light of our collective flame. For 50 years, this place has made for all sorts of experiences, making those experiences possible, and they couldn't have happened otherwise, enabling us to discover the good and the true and the right, and the experiences continue. Our tradition of seeking for 50 years, this place has been a haven to all who thirst for compassion and for all who are afraid and need encouragement, inviting all who yearn for acceptance. For 50 years, this place has made the invisible visible and tangible, our spirit, our values, our commitments, a living mandala, as Nina said, igniting our passion for justice and for peace. How wonderful as we feel the fullness of our days. How wonderful as we feel the burden of our days to be able to come here and feel renewed by beloved community. This is our stone soup miracle right here. This is it. How wonderful to be able to call this place home. How wonderful.